want to thank Brother Israel for that is leading us in those beautiful songs. And uh, certainly he does a tremendous job, and we appreciate him and the work he does of the church. Appreciate Brother Lord's prayer just a moment ago, and really appreciated the part where he talked about as a nation uh, that we can elect leaders that will draw closer to God. And so those are things that that really we are dealing with in our day and time, and hopefully that we can uh, become closer to God as a nation. Uh, things doesn't seem to be getting any easier, but yet what we do want to do is is do all that we can to to be faithful to God, and that's what it means. Tonight our lesson is from the book of Jeremiah. It's just really the introduction uh, is what we're going to use from the book of Jeremiah. And it's the a question, God says, is not my word like a fire? You know, the Bible uses many illustrations and oftentimes the word of God is illustrated such as fire. Uh, sometimes it's illustrated as a hammer. In fact, in this very, one of the very verses that we talked about, this talk about God's word is like a hammer. Uh, and we'll talk about those and, and to understand what is going on in the book of Jeremiah, we need a little bit of history. Jeremiah was God's prophet in Jerusalem. At the same time, Daniel was God's prophet in the palace at Babylon. And at the same time, God's prophet into the children of Israel that were in a prison camp in Babylon was Ezekiel. And so God uses all of these men and the message basically is the same. But Jeremiah was right in the middle of the, the heat, the very middle of the very trouble that Israel as a nation or Judah as a nation was in. During this period, the people of Judah, the kings of Judah, began to follow after the gods of the Amorites and the Moabites. And it's very interesting to know that those gods there were called the fire gods. It's because they would offer human sacrifice. Now, they didn't offer adult human sacrifices. These were babies. And such as Chemosh and Moloch was the names of these gods. Those that would bring children there and just offer them, well, you might ask, well, why would they offer, why would they burn their babies? Why would they do that? Well, the reason was a lot of those babies were born out of wedlock, and they were trying to hide their sin. And so they would take these children that were born and offer them to the fire gods and, and burn those children alive. And that's that's what the, the children of Israel or the nation of Israel was doing at this time. And you know, we think about this, what would be the difference in taking those babies and burning them alive, offering them as human sacrifice than abortion? What's the difference? Because we know that in this past week or week and a half ago that the uh, in the um, clinics that uh, have the embryos, I can't even think of what it's called now, has been, they classified those embryos as a living being, as, as they classified them as a human being. And yet we have people on the other side who would rather destroy those and try to hide anything that they want to, to get rid of their responsibility. And that's exactly what's going on in, in this, in, in the thing of Judah or in the country of Judah or the city of Jerusalem at this time. And so I'm going to read a couple of passages and talk about the, the things, the background that it is for us to get a feel. Now, Jeremiah starts out as a young man, as a prophet, and he's going up against, a, the God says, a rebellious nation. Now, understand the book of Jeremiah is not written in chronological order. It's not this verse and this verse and chronologically. But Jeremiah really deals with topics or subjects. And in this particular section, he is dealing with God's promise to send a destructive force upon Jerusalem. 
And that's going to be Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to send pestilence to them, that is disease. He's going to send an army that will wipe out the, the kings and, and those. Daniel is caught in the middle of that. He's captured and taken to Babylon. But all of these wars are happening in Jerusalem. And it's all because of this, that they have rebelled against God, that they have failed to, to keep the word of God and to keep the law. And so there's this statement that is made within this, is not my word uh, like a fire? So when we look at Jeremiah chapter 14, and verse number 13, Jeremiah says, Ah, Lord, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. Now that really infuriated the Lord when these false prophets were saying to the people that, you know, you're not going to, have, the sword is not coming against you. Your enemy is not going to destroy you. There's going to be peace in this land. Jeremiah has already said because of your sin that God is sending the sword. God is sending the pestilence. God is sending destruction. And it's coming by Nebuchadnezzar. But yet these false prophets prophesied in the name of God, and they lied about what God said. And then we see in another passage in Jeremiah chapter 23, in verse number 21, he says, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they have stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from evil, their evil way, and from the evil of their doings. So what is being said here is these prophesy, these prophets are lying about what God has said. There's going to be peace in the land. But God says if they had, had spoke my words, then they would have turned the people back to God. And certainly they would... Uh, that evil would not come upon them. But another passage we see in James chapter 3 in verse number 1 where James says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive the greater judgment. Now what has that got to do with all this? What this has to do is that number one, God is holding these prophets responsible for the destruction of a nation. God is holding these kings, the ones that have turned to Moloch and Ammon to worship them, to burn children, to offer them as human sacrifice, to hold them in, responsible, to hold them responsible. And I can say this, the Bible is very clear about it, that God will hold nations, the leaders of nations, responsible for the sins that they do against humanity and against others. And we've seen a, a lot of problems in the world uh, throughout history. We've seen uh, the Cambodian problem. We've seen where one society will try to destroy another society and wipe out a race. It happens in Africa. It happens in the Middle East. It happens all over the world. And what the Bible teaches us through reading these historical events is that God holds these leaders accountable for their sins. And no one's immune to the judgment of God. And so we, when we get this, this far, we see that these people have committed a great sin and then they lied about what God has said to the nation. Then we look at another passage in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 24. Can anyone hide himself in secret places? So I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not feel of heaven and earth, says the Lord? Have I not heard the prophets uh, have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have a dream, I have a dream. 
And then verse number 28 and 29. Let's see, I guess I missed, missed that. But in 28 and 29, the prophets who had a, a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who has my words, let him speak my words faithfully. That is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces? The book of Jeremiah is very interesting because God now has interjected himself and has made these direct prophecies to these nations and holding them accountable. And it comes down to this. Is not my word like a fire? Well, we know that fire, it purifies, and it's going to, to cleanse this land. God is going to send a destructive force that is in Nebuchadnezzar. Now, although he was a very wicked man himself, God uses him to clean the idolatry off the land. I've said this before, and I thought, find it very interesting that God told these kings and told these people, he says, I will be like a man that wipes a plate. He says, here's a man that, that eats his supper on a plate. And when he's done, he just wipes it off. He says, I'm going to wipe the land of idolatry. I'm going to wipe idolatry from the land. And so we can see at this particular point how that God is wrath is kindled against a rebellious nation, that they have turned to these idols. They've turned to these, these uh, fire gods and these false prophets and these false gods and these idols. And so now it's coming to an end. If we go and look at the history, what we see is that in 605 BC, that Nebuchadnezzar comes down and he captures Jerusalem. That's the beginning of the fall of Jerusalem. Captured in that is Daniel and, and uh, Shadrach. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego but that was their Babylonian name, takes them to Babylon, puts them in the palace, makes a science project out of him. He, he feeds them with the king's meat and tries to, to teach them the ways of the Chaldeans. And then he comes back a few years later in 589, and he captures, um, or 590, 598. You might have to help me with my dates there, Brother Israel. But comes back and he captures the middle class, he captures the, the people who are bricklayers, who are painters, who are carpenters. He captures all of those and takes them to a prison camp. And among them is Ezekiel. So Ezekiel is the prophet to God's people that are in captive uh, in a prison camp 60 miles south of Babylon. And then he comes back in 587 and he literally destroys Jerusalem wipes it out. He, he, he destroys the Jerusalem. He tears the walls down. He burns the temple. And there, Jerusalem is going to lay waste for some 70 years because of their sin. So we can see God's anger kindled. And when we come to the, the saying, is my word like a fire. That's what I want to talk about tonight. Is God's word like a fire? And it is. It very is. Well, we think about how valuable that life is, that God's word does give life. It is very valuable. When we think about our sun, our sun is 70% hydrogen, 28% helium, 1.5% carbon, nitrogen and oxygen, 0.5% is neon, iron, uh, uh, silicon, magnesium, and sulfur, and the sun is 109 times bigger than the earth. It is, the sun is 894,000 miles across. Now, I don't know how they measured that. I guess they did it with a with a telescope or precision. But the thing is that our sun is, is a fireball in the sky, one of the smallest stars of the universe, 
and and yet what we find is that the light is very valuable. When we think of Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 15, there we see where Paul said that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You see, light is 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 very valuable. If, if we didn't have the lights on, then it'd be darker, a lot darker. When it's dark outside, then the lights off in here, you probably can't see a whole lot of anything. But the point is, is this, that light has influence in the darkness and that the world can, can see that we sh are shining like lights uh, in the darkness. And there is the comparison to that. In John chapter 8, in verse number 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. You see, we need light in order to, to function in the world. Now, most of my slides are a dark background with a white letters, and, and I do that on purpose because it is easier to read, at least for some, most people it's easier to read. And, and so when we think about the importance of light, because our eyes are attracted to light. If you look at a photograph, your eyes are going to be looking at the brightest part of that, that uh, photograph. That's the way that we're designed. We are attracted to light. And we as Christians are the light of the world. We, we allow the gospel of Christ to shine through us that we preach the gospel of Christ. When the world turns to darkness, when the world begins to, to go after the evil things of the world, the church ought to be the one that shines a light in a dark place to give hope, to, to have this influence, and that this light certainly uh, is one that, that influences. But also the word of God is like a fire because uh, it's comforting. But let me go back to this passage in John chapter one and verse four. It says, in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend that. When Jesus came into the world, he was the light of the world. And when he came in, they did not recognize him as the Messiah. They did not recognize him as the Son of God. They did not know that here is God among us, is what the scriptures would say. And, and as Jesus walked through the world, many of the, the Jews rejected him. A lot of the Gentiles accepted Jesus as the Messiah. But as we see where Jesus comes into the world and lives his life. In those three years of his ministry, as we call it, he, he attracts people. He brings people together. And he's the light of the world. He brings hope to the world. And so when we think about Jesus as the light of the world, it is the light which God has sent. And then we see that God's word is like a fire because it comforts. You think about the Word of God and how, how well it is put together. 66 books, some 40 writers, over a period of 1,500 years. The Bible is, is, does not contradict itself. It, it, you know, you can go through the Bible and just read and, and see uh, how well that it is put together. The thing is, somebody says, well, I find the contradiction. If you find a contradiction, uh, there's either two, three things that are going on. Number one, you don't have a correct translation, and that can happen. Or number two, what you have is people who, who deny or don't understand the verse. And the Word of God is so precise. It, it, it gives us details, and that brings comfort to us. Because when we see uh, of, the, of the message that is there, you know, I remember uh, my grandfather and 
grandmother living in a uh, home and uh, on a farm out in Steens, Mississippi. And in that, I remember that uh, they always had a fire going in the fireplace. I, I don't know if that was their only heat. I was just a kid, but I can remember my grandfather building a fire in the fireplace, and I can remember the, the fire burning the coals. Uh, he would move the coals around and, and add more wood, and, and the fire would get up. And it, it, you could sit by that fireplace, and it was just comfortable to be there. It was a it was a place of comfort. It was a source of heat for us. And, and so we enjoy that. And, and God's word is similar to that in that it brings us comfort. You think about the comforting passages uh, of the scriptures. When we look at Psalm chapter 23, and I didn't type all this out, but look what, at what it says. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you realize that that passage of scripture is read at many, many, many funerals? People find comfort in that, and it is a, a, a passage of scripture that brings comfort, that gives us comfort. Because we, we know that God is our shepherd and, and we find comfort in him leading us and caring for us and tending to us. And David, though he was the king of Israel, began as a young boy, as a shepherd. And so as David writes this from life's experience, he compares a shepherd to, to God. He is the shepherd that cares for the sheep. But another passage that we can turn to to find comfort is in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, where Peter says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. That is a very comforting passage to know that, that in times that we're facing difficulty, and every day may be a new experience for us. We may never have experienced those things. Maybe death comes in the family. It may be sickness. It may be trials. It tribulations, whatever comes our way. We take comfort in, in casting our cares upon him because the Bible says, for he cares for you. You know, sometimes we think about that nobody understands our emotions or our feelings. Nobody understands our situation. We know that there are people that uh, are can be around us that have faced the similar difficulties, but somehow we get this idea of thinking that we're all alone in the world. Even David, as a king, says this, no man cares for my soul. That was one of the lowest parts of David's life when he wrote that. And yet that is just so far from the truth. There are many people that are around us that love us, but the one thing that we can count on is that God listens. He cares for us. You think about the time that as Christ hung upon the cross, and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, the evidence is that here's God and perhaps turned his back on Christ because he, he sent Christ to the cross. Jesus pleaded in the Garden of Gethsemane before that. But yet what we, what we do know is that God has sent his son so that we can have eternal life. In the darkest hours of Jesus' life, he faced the same things that we would face in our life at times. And yet here is, is the comforting hand of God 
surrounded by us. So the word of God is, is comfort. There's so many things that we could turn to and talk about in the Bible. There's just so many different subjects. But we find great comfort in the Word of God. And then the last point I want to make is uh, this, is that God's Word uh, is like a fire because it purifies. And you think about what fire does, that uh, when silver is passed through the fire, it burns the impurities. Well, gold also burns off all the impurities. Uh, so when you go through the fire, when it's refined, you have 24-karat uh, gold burning out all the, the impurities and things. But the Word of God is like that because it's like a fire. We go through trials and tribulation. And the Word of God, especially in the days of Jeremiah, are going to deal with the problems of the land, the sin of the land, but also to, to the word of God purifies, it cleanses us, uh, even in our souls that we see. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 22, Peter says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in a sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The word of God purifies us. It, it, it changes us. It, it helps correct the problems we have. It puts us on the right path. And so here's the word of God that, that simply purifies. And so God's message through Jeremiah to the prophets or to those kings and through those false prophets, even though they rejected them, God's word purified that nation. God's word brought back a, a nation, destroyed the idolatry off the land, and then 70 years later brings back a nation that is headed to bring the Messiah into the world. We think about how that the word of God continues to purify. In Matthew chapter 3, um, well, I missed a, a passage there. But in Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 10, there John the Baptist says this, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, therefore every tree which does not hear bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now let's don't confuse the, the concept of Holy Spirit and fire. It's two different baptisms. And what he's talking about is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, meaning the apostles, would receive the word of God, would be inspired men who would teach and preach. But the baptism of fire is a baptism of punishment. And that was directed to those who rejected Jesus as the Messiah, rejected those who would not turn and repent and come back to God. And, and so when we think about how that God's word is like a fire, it purifies. God purified nations with his word. God purified leaders and, and, and brought them about. And certainly we find where we are going through trials and tribulations and that the word of God helps us make that transformation uh, in correcting the faults that are in our life. In 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse number 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are therein will be burned up. Therefore, since all of these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And here's the point I want to make, that in one day, one day, the word of God is going to be spoken and the judgment will be coming. The end of time will be coming. The earth will be burned up. The wicked will be punished. And of course, they will uh, stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All of the universe 
everything of God's creation will be burned up just by the word, God speaking his word. And so one day this world is coming to an end. We have no idea. We have no time uh, limit that we can turn to to see. But yet what we do know is that God is true to his word. And so when we think about the word of God, we think about it as that it gives comfort, uh, that it gives life, it gives comfort, and that it purifies. There's many more things that we could talk about, but these are just a few things that I looked at. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, you can obey the gospel of Christ. Come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repenting of all sins, confess Christ before others, to be buried in baptism for the remission of sins, putting us into Christ, putting us into the Lord's church. Maybe you've done that, and you have turned away from God. Repent of those sins. Come back to God. The church will pray with you. Would you come as together with standing?